Hi, I'm Walt Heyer. I started my transgender journey when I was four years old. I struggled with my identity all the way through my life, and I eventually underwent gender reassignment surgery, lived eight years as Laura Jensen, until I found the Lord Jesus Christ, who redeemed and restored my life so that I could give my testimony today. You know, I started my journey uh, in Los Angeles, California, when my dad would drop me off at my grandmother's house. She was a seamstress, and she was making dresses as a way to make a living, and decided to make me a purple chiffon evening dress when I was only four years old. And she put me in that dress, and she began to affirm and kind of fawn over me and tell me how cute I was as a little girl. And um, that started within me um, confusion about who I was. Why was Grandma so excited about seeing me as a girl? because she never affirmed me as the little boy I was in the little cowboy boots with the tore up jeans and a cowboy hat, which was much more of who I was. I became so kind of accustomed to the affirmation that she was giving me, I wanted it more. And so I en ended up taking the purple dress home so that I could feel that even when I was at home and grandma wasn't there. And one of the keys to that was she said, this is our little secret. When I took the dress home, my mother found the dress in the bottom dresser drawer and confronted me, and that ended my ever going back to Grandma's house. The story began to go through the family, and when Uncle Fred found out about it, uh, he began to uh, feel that I was fair game to be sexually molested. And so he began molesting me and teasing me and taunting me, and, and my dad was so perplexed by this, what Grandma was doing, that he began to exert a lot more discipline on me, thinking that if he was using sort of manly, heavy discipline, that he could sort of mold and shape me into a man. But what the discipline did, because it was so really harsh, really diminished who I was. And so I had these events before I was nine years old, being cross-dressed, being uh, disciplined with a hardwood floor plank and being sexually molested. You can understand that a little boy at that time, really, not only is he confused, but wants to escape into something else. And this is where, you know, you use this transgender identity to escape into something that isn't getting abused. I think I was, in my mind, thought, well, nobody knows about this other person that I'm becoming. I realized that, you know, who is safe to talk to? So I didn't really tell anybody about it, but went on in school to you know, run in track, I played in football, I did boy things, but there was always the girl in the purple dress in my head that just kept haunting me, really, saying you really need to change, you're really a girl, you're not a boy. And so there was this tremendous conflict between the, the girl in the purple dress and the boy who was trying to be a boy named Walt. And eventually I was in church and I saw a gal come into church and I told my friend, I said, I'm gonna marry her. And so eventually we got married when I was 21 and we had two children. I was married for 17 years. And eventually I went to work for American Honda Motor Company and became a top executive. But during that time, I was struggling so deeply with my gender identity because of what happened when I was a kid. It never went away. No matter how successful I was, I was struggling. And so I went to a transgender specialist who diagnosed me with gender dysphoria, administered hormones to me, talked to my wife at the time about it. We ended up getting divorced in 1983 in April. I underwent gender reassignment surgery and, and assumed the identity of Laura Jensen. I lived that way for eight years. You know, right after I had the surgery, I'm laying in the bed, and there's sort of this funny thing that you just go through and you think, wow, the weight of the world has now been lifted off of me. So you're in the hospital for four days recovering from the surgery. You have these feelings, you leave the hospital, you get on the plane. But I, I wondered at the time, you know, can surgery really, really change you? It doesn't eliminate being sexually abused. It doesn't eliminate the cross-dressing. It doesn't eliminate the physical abuse. I think there's a period of time where you're totally convinced that it worked and you're absolutely positive you did the right thing. But there's also the creep that comes in that there's times when you have that quiet moment with yourself, when no one's around, you're alone, and you begin to realize that 
well, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing. Maybe this didn't fix what you needed to fix. So then I notified Honda about my change. They terminated me and within three months I was homeless and living in a park in Long Beach and a full-blown alcoholic. And from the uh, homeless in the park, I ended up going to AA meetings. I ended up, uh, someone at the meeting took me to their home and I was going to church. Those were my two biggest things in trying to recover from my alcoholism. So I was going to AA meetings sometimes two or three times a day and going to church as often as I could. And so this one church that I went to in the Bay Area, I was kind of fearful about going to church as Laura, but I went in and talked to the pastor there. And I said, you know, um, I'm Laura. I used to be Walt. I'll be honest with you. I just want to know, are you going to try to change me back to Walt? And he said, no. He said, as a pastor, he said, my job is to love you. If you're going to change back to Walt, that's God's job, not mine. And so he allowed me to go to church. He allowed me to be in groups, and they had a recovery ministry there. So I was seeing counselors. And so as I began to go um, seek out help for this, I found that I'd had a, a it, not multiple personalities, but what they call a dissociative disorder, which today we've learned that probably upwards of 30% of the people who identify as transgender actually have dissociative disorders, quite common. The other thing is body dysmorphia and obsessive compulsive disorders and other disorders that are present also with the diagnosis of gender dysphoria. So when I got treated for this and began to identify with it, going to therapy as many as once a day, every day for weeks, even months. And when I finally got to my fourth step and I had all these things written down on a piece of paper about being cross-dressed and being molested and we had gone through them. It took over two hours, one by one. We're praying about them. He's dealing with them as best we can and trying to really turn them over to the Lord and get rid of them. And so when we were done, we went outside and he put a match to the corner of the paper and let it begin to burn. The gentle breeze took the flames in the paper and they just disappeared. And then he patted me on the shoulder. He says, okay, now it's time to go pray. An image came to me in that prayer and it was the Lord Jesus Christ and he was reaching down toward me and I began to look at where his hands were and there was a little baby there and I realized that that little baby was me and he grabbed the little baby and pulled it into his arms and then he turned and spoke to me and he says you are now safe with me forever and I realized at that very moment that the Lord came to hold me and to redeem my life because he said, you are now safe with me forever. And that's where I was rescued by Jesus Christ from my transgender life. So then I began to live out my life as Walt. The Lord wants the transgender community in the church. The Lord wants them in the pews. The Lord wants them to hear the truth that something happened to them that was horrible and that they had every right to feel the feelings they were feeling, but the only way to really escape pain in your life is turn it over to Jesus Christ. Allow him to have the pain so that he can restore you so that the pain goes away. And so church leaders need to have their arms open to them and welcome them in, but listen to their stories. You know, it's never too late to be redeemed and restored by Jesus Christ. You can do that on your deathbed. It's never, ever too late. You're never too old, and it's never too late. Put yourself in front of Jesus Christ. Admit your wrong. Turn your life over to him and allow him to transform you back to who he made you to be.